Hello all, today we're going to do a review of meditations 2 and 3, um, and that is just pages 24, 28 through 40 in the Blackburn. So the reading that was assigned just covers Descartes' meditations, which you'll also read, but Blackburn presents this material in a little bit more accessible way, so it'll be useful to go over this first before you read the primary text. I would also recommend that once you've read the primary texts, you might go back and review some of the main arguments, the central points that Blackburn identifies, so that you can have something to write about in your weekly writing, and just so that you can get a sense of what Blackburn is referring to. You can see, you know, which passages correspond. So I'll just briefly go over this, and then we'll go over it in more depth in the in the later um, lectures on the meditations. But Blackburn briefly overviews the meditations and then provides some objections. So I'll just do that as well and provide some additional comments. So before we go on and get ahead of ourselves, I think it's important to just review where we're at so far. So we're reading Descartes this week, and Descartes is famous for his radical skepticism, that is, doubting everything offered to us by reason and the senses and this is known as his famous method of doubt so a reasonable question is why is he in invoking this strange and extreme standard this method of doubt uh, and the idea there is that he's striving for certain knowledge right so how can we get certainty we can get certainty by not believing in anything we thought was true by being skeptical about everything and having to prove every belief from the ground up. So starting over from the foundations and in this way we can come to have certain knowledge about the things that we hope to know about. So towards the end of tearing down what we thought we knew towards the project of radical skepticism, Descartes invokes three arguments. These should be familiar by now but it's worthwhile review so there's the part of prudence argument and that is an argument against the senses which maintains that any thing that has deceived us before should not be trusted the senses have deceived us before so senses should not be trusted so the principle underwriting this extreme position is once again just a certainty condition right so for reasonable daily living, this might not be a good rule, but if you're trying to achieve certainty, you should never trust anything that's led you to error before. But it still seems like, even in this case, there's some things that are just undoubtable, that, you know, I have hands or something like that is the example Descartes uses. So there's the dream argument, which is a further argument against the senses, and in this one, the point is, is that any, at any given moment, you can't know whether or not you're awake or in a dream. And if you can't know whether you're awake or in a dream, if there's no way to discern, at any given moment, you have to be skeptical because you could be mistaken. So from moment to moment, at every moment, we can't trust the veracity of our senses. So a further reason to be worried about sense perception. And then finally, of course, there's the evil demon, and the evil demon is an argument not just against the senses, but against reason, because of course, even in a dream, a, a square still has four sides, and two plus three equals five, but it's possible for an all-powerful evil demon to convince us somehow that a square has three sides, or some other sort of thing like that, or right now when we're very convinced that a square has four sides, that could just be, we could be confused. We could be conceptually confused about the definition of a square. So the evil demon is a final round of objection so that we doubt both reason and the senses. So that's the important contribution of the evil demon. But at the end of the day, moving into meditation two, right, is one indubitable truth, and that is the cogito, and the cogito is namely that 
no matter el what else is going on, there's someone thinking during this entire process. So that fact alone suggests that someone exists. So the fact that there's thinking suggests that there's a thinking thing. And that just seems to be a necessary truth of what it is to be thinking. So even if every single thing, if you're deceived in every single way, I mean, the fact that you're deceived presupposes that there's someone to deceive. So there's one fact we know, and that's that there's a person. Or a thinking thing. I shouldn't say a person. A thinking thing. Whatever that might be. But Blackburn gives reasons to doubt even this simple truth of the cogito. So the problem that Blackburn identifies in the section entitled The Elusive Eye is that this this I, this self, this thinking subject seems to be devoid of content in a problematic way. So if you think about if somebody asks you who are you, right, you'll you'll tell them some series of facts about yourself, you're you're a student, you're from a certain region in the world. You're a hokey now. Um, so these sorts of things, right? But recall that for Descartes, none of these sorts of facts are admissible in terms of things that we can claim about ourselves because that could all be made up by the evil demon, right? These are things that we've drawn from memory and from sense experience. And of course, we could be wrong about any given memory or something we've been told, so you can't trust any of those sorts of facts. So if you just sort of introspect and you have to not consider any of these background information about your life experiences, it seems like there is no unitary subject in there. If you just kind of reflect and you can't refer to these sorts of facts about yourself, there, there seems to be no I. Um, you might also put this point a little bit differently and say, even if you have all of these experiences, you can introspect, and it seems like there's nothing more than a bundle of experiences throughout the course of a lifetime. There's no extra thing above and beyond that's called an I, a self. The self just is all of those bundles of life experiences. So if we don't have that bundle, there's nothing more to say. So... One way that this is put, and it's said pithily by, I think his name was Lichtenberg, he says, just as you don't say, you just, there's someone causing thunder, you just say, it thunders. You just say, it thinks, or thinking occurs, right? So the most we can say is that, not that some subject, I think, you can only say, there is thinking. So... Even at the most foundational level, you might think that Descartes assumes too much. So that's one objection that's worth considering. You might want to respond to that in a weekly writing or something like that. Um, provide additional reasons why you agree or disagree with this objection to the cogito. Just a suggestion. You can do any number of things. So a distinct point that is addressed by Descartes, and it's mentioned by Blackburn, but I'm doing it a little bit more systematically because I think it's important to be aware of this sort of thing, is that Descartes is a dualist. So in terms of metaphysics, this is the metaphysical position that there are two distinct kinds of substances, namely, in most cases, bodies and minds. And so when we say kinds of substances, we mean that these are radically different sorts of things, that they don't overlap in any way. They're just totally unique sorts of things. So the modern worldview, to contrast, these days is generally that there is one sort of thing, right, matter and energy, and it can interchange in various ways, but they're not radically distinct. But Descartes is a dualist, so he does think they're radically distinct. And so part of the reason why he thinks this to be the case is this argument that he provides here. So the thought goes, I cannot doubt that I exist, but I can doubt that I have a body, therefore I am not my body. That is to say that the mind and body are distinct. So if you know all the properties of something, right, you know every single fact about an object, 
and some other thing is missing and something you're you're shown something and it has some property that's different then you know it's not an identical thing right it can't just be the same thing like if you're shown a quarter and one is perfectly glossy but weighs the exact same number of milligrams or whatever and then somebody puts it behind their back and shows you another shows you a quarter again you don't know if it's the same or another one but it has a scratch on it that fact suggests it's not the same quarter it might be the same quarter but because it has that distinct property namely of being scratched you think that's a distinct thing so in the, so i guess the idea here is something similar to that insofar as this distinct feature that you can doubt one and not doubt the other suggests that they're different sorts of things um, so Blackburn calls this the mask man fallacy, right? So you can come up with an imaginative case in which you say, I think the case that Blackburn uses is, I know my dad, and my dad's no bank robber, so that, that bank robber wearing a mask isn't my dad. But clearly, it could be the case that the man wearing the mask is in fact your father or a bank robber or whatever, right? So there seems to be a disconnect between what we know and what is the case. And Descartes is kind of being slippery here when he acts like what he thinks he knows can be a criteria for what is real and what's not. So there seems to be a distinction between metaphysics and epistemology, and he's trying to fudge that distinction by using a sort of epistemic status of the things that he knows and doesn't know as a metaphysical criteria, as a criteria about what is real in the world. So, I guess another point that you might add here is that there seems to be a suppressed premise. And that suppressed premise is namely that if I can doubt one thing and not the other, those two things are distinct. So this is an additional needed premise in order to justify the inference that there must be some distinction here. And so rather than this being a fallacy anymore, so you no longer think that this is fallacious, what you just say is that it's probably not valid, right? It just doesn't follow. But in any case, it's just an important exercise to identify those sorts of um, suppressed premises, you know. I might ask you at some point, what's a suppressed premise in this argument? What would make this a valid argument is basically what I'd be asking. So we'll move on then. So the next big thing, and this is still in meditation too, um, is the wax argument. And so Descartes seems to be having some troubles with this, with the cogito issue of how we know um, that there is a unitary subject, the self, the I, and he, rather than addressing this issue in more depth, he kind of switches topics and goes to more general issue of how we come to know bodies at all. And I guess this is tangentially related, related to the self because we think there's some intimate relationship between us and our bodies, right? If not an absolute relationship. So the issue here is how we come to know about bodies. So, take a piece of wax, right, and it's a certain color, it's purple, and it smells of honey, and it's hard, and it's cylindrical, and put it by a fire, and all of those properties will change. It will become soft, and an oval, or a mush blob. Um, if you hit it, it won't make a sound anymore. It doesn't smell sweet, because that's been burned off. So at the end of the day it still seems like we still think that there's the same piece of wax there right so there's this fact and this basic fact needs some sort of explanation so how are we going to explain this well we can only come to know about this fact by a few different means and those means are reason the senses or imagination I guess that's an exhaustive list if you can come up with some other interesting category um, 
that would be an interesting point to bring up. Maybe you think intuition is something different. Although I think Descartes seems to think that's a part of reason, but that's a complicated issue. In any case, so there's these three categories. Descartes just sort of stipulates, and then he deduces in the classical sense um, by saying what it isn't, and so what remains becomes obvious. So he says it's not the senses, because of course all the sensible properties change. Everything that we could sense about it five minutes ago is now different, so it couldn't just be that we're tracking the sense perceptions, because then we would just have two distinct things. By all the criteria of what we can sense, it's different. And it's not the imagination, because we're not envisioning the exact blob that it turns into, so it's not that sort of imaginative projection into the future. It's by some sort of capacity of reasoning, some sort of faculty of the mind, of intuition that allows us to make this sort of inference. So the point here is not that it is just reason, right? To some extent, of course Descartes has to admit that our sense perception is involved in the process, right? You wouldn't have any idea of, of wax unless you had perceived it initially. But the way in which we know with any confidence that there's a persistent identity to this piece of wax that, that is the same piece of wax, the way we know that fact is through reason and not just the senses. The senses provide the initial raw data, but reason is what allows us to make these additional conjectures about identity through time or something like that. Otherwise, it would just be moment-to-moment -moment impressions of perceptions sort of bombarding you, and you'd have no way to organize them without some sort of reasoning faculty. So this point is just a general claim about the, the centrality of reason over the senses. So how do we know about ourselves? We know about ourselves because of reason. How do we know about the identity of bodies? Again, it's a result of reasoning. And so this is just a feature of Descartes' rationalism, right? The, the way we come to know things is through reason. Um, and there's a principle that underrides this sort of insistence on reason as the prime means of attaining knowledge, and that is clear and distinct ideas. So, clear and distinct ideas are self-evident truths that cannot be logically denied. So this is the sort of idea that justifies the cogito. And when you read through the meditations, you'll see Descartes a few di in a number of places say, oh, well, I clearly and distinctly perceive that X, right? Um, so when he's saying that, he's saying that this is something that you just can't deny if you understand even minimally what's entailed in the concept. So if you just minimally understand that to be deceived, that requires something that is deceivable, right? If you understand that simple, just like conceptual fact, you're going to be committed to the claim that there is something to be deceived, right? So if something is deceived, there has to be something deceived. And it seems almost so trivial, but that's the sort of logical necessity. It's kind of like 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? It's just so rigidly entailed that it's not really adding any interesting new content. But these sorts of things are certain, and that's what we're after, right? So it's the simple foundational self-evident truths that are the groundwork for what justifies future knowledge. So just like there's the conceptual entailment of the cogito, you can't coherently deny that a square has four sides. You clearly and distinctly understand that if it's a square, it must have four sides. That's just a feature of you understanding the relevant concept. Um, and as I already noted, sort of this is a rationalist method. So rationalism is the position, the epistemic position that, I mean, that's kind of already entailed in the term knowledge, right? Because we're talking about knowledge. But it's the epistemic condition, position that knowledge is obtained independently of the senses from reason alone. And so with this sort of system, he employs 
clear and distinct ideas to justify a number of things. And one of the things that he ends up justifying with this idea is the existence of God. Um, and that comes in Meditation 3. So we'll move to that one. So the central argument of Meditation 3, and it's a long meditation and a lot of things go on, but he's fairly redundant in this one. So it's just helpful to reiterate the same sort of points and get the big picture is this trademark argument, right? So the general gist of the argument is that we have an idea of perfection, and that just seems to be true enough, right? So you at least have some vague conception of what it is to be perfect. Maybe not. You can't fully imagine it, but you have this idea. And Descartes stipulates that each effect must have a cause, which is greater than the effect. And so this is kind of a relic of the medieval tradition, but it, it makes some sense, right? So you might wonder how any sort of thing can come to be, like an idea of whatever, right, of a cat or something. It seems like how could this idea just come about on its own? It's going to have to come from some place, something prior to it that in some way resembles it um, and has more actuality than it. Right, and that's where we come up with these ideas. So that is what motivates the same idea of perfection or of God, is that if we have an idea of it, then that idea must come from some place, and that thing must be more perfect than the effect. So as a result, only God can cause such an idea. And I'll go through this a little bit in, in a little bit more detail in the Meditation 3 lecture, um, but for now this is just the broad gist of it. So, so the trademark portion, the reason why it's called the trademark argument, is that there will be some residual features from the original in the effect, right? So there's this effect, it's the idea of perfection, this idea of God, and there's a certain imprint, there's a trademark imprinted in that idea, and that's the trademark from a higher being that was capable of creating the idea. And so the way that you know that there's God is because he's, it, he, whatever, has imprinted his insignia, metaphorically speaking, into the idea because that idea couldn't arise unless there was a perfect thing. So that's the claim. Um, and so you might be a little bit skeptical. This seems like a strange argument. Um, it's an interesting idea. But it seems like it's going to come with some problems. So there's two that um, Blackburn identifies, and one that I sort of note that's actually not me. This is a historical one, but we'll go through them in turn. So the first claim is that Descartes is not entitled to the claim that every effect has a cause. So if you take the position of radical skepticism, where we don't know anything about the universe or the things that are going on around us, how could you say that every effect must have some cause, right? So the fact that there's a sound, right, it seems like there must be a cause of that. I was rapping on my laptop with my knuckles. But that's already because you have a whole bunch of knowledge about the world and you're assuming that that's holding true right now for you. But, of course, Descartes doesn't have that access like he can't he can't invoke people's knuckles and facts about acoustics because that could all be a figment of his imagination or a product of the evil demon. So he doesn't seem to be able to say that every cause must have an effect because that's sort of a metaphysical claim about the way the world is that goes much beyond what a radical skeptic has legitimate access to. And then the second point is even if every effect has a cause, you might think that effects need not resemble their causes. So the more we know about the modern world, the more we come to realize there's all sorts of strange events, right? So this is a relatively simplistic one, and I kept it from Blackburn um, because it's clear enough. So take the example of the arrangement of iron flex as a result of electromagnetism, right? So you can just imagine one of those middle school science experiments or something in which you just drag a magnet across a whole bunch of little iron shavings and the iron shavings will arrange themselves in certain ways and stick or be repulsed to the magnet. Um, 
And that effect that of this behavior of little shavings of metal doesn't resemble electromagnetism, which is an entirely different thing as a result of the properties of electrons. So there doesn't seem to be any sort of resemblance. So you might think that it's just kind of false that there's this sort of trademark imprinting in every effect. So some effects are not like their causes. So it might be the case that the effect of the idea of God is just caused by something radically different, like a bunch of neurons firing in a specific pattern, right? So the effect doesn't need to be like the cause. Um, and that's just a feature of our more modern worldview. And then the last one that I had, um, some historical contemporary, I forget his name at this point, pointed out that this sort of position has absurd results. So you could apply it to other cases. You could say, well, I have an idea of a perfect island. If I have such an idea, that must be from somewhere. So there must be a perfect island. So you can see how that's the same sort of reasoning. You know, I have this idea of God, and this idea of God must come from somewhere, so there must be a God. You could do the exact same thing with a perfect island or a perfect unicorn. So it seems like, in this case, it proves too much. If If we hold it to be true that this sort of trademark effect exists, then we could say it claims a whole range of things about any perfect video games, perfect laptops, perfect unicorns and islands and anything else you could imagine. So that seems like too strong of a claim. So those are some problems and this is a brief rundown of the two, the second two meditations, numbers two and three. Uh, I hope it was helpful. Always ask questions if you have any and I will now cover meditations two and three in more depth. Okay, thanks.